So good evening. I'm Graham Allison, the director of Belfer Center. Uh, we have a five-star show tonight, so lots to look forward to. Uh, we have two distinguished journalists, uh, Dina and David. Their resumes are in your uh, in the handout. We have two distinguished professors who also served to, in the intelligence community, John Deutsch and uh, Joe Nye. John served as director of CAA. Joe served as uh, chairman of the Intelligence Council. And we have Congressman Jane Harmon, the hardest one to get to come to town, uh, who uh, served uh, nine terms in Congress, who served four terms on the Intelligence Oversight Committee and four terms on the Homeland Security Committee, and who's a graduate of Harvard Law School, so we have a lawyer in the panel, and she's currently chairman uh, of the Woodrow Wilson Center, a think tank in Washington. So we have a huge topic. We have a great group of people to discuss it. And we're going to try to be uh, short, brief, uh, lively. Uh, and we'll be disagreeable. Uh, we'll, be, we'll, we'll disagree without being disagreeable. Okay. So it if- It doesn't resemble Congress then. Not, not like no. Congress. Uh, no. the, the whole set of uh, stories about NSA have come so much like an avalanche. Uh, that most people are confused about it. I would say, if you're not confused, you haven't been watching. So trying to get some points of clarity in the midst of that much noise is extremely difficult. The cartoons that we offered you for the warm-up, uh, I think, uh, get close to the heart of the matter. So let me see cartoon one here, which is my summary of what I think actually, if I were to do the short summary. So I don't mind giving up the appearance of privacy to live with the illusion of safety. I'd say that's pretty close to the mark. If you're going to do your own one minute takeaway with all the confusion on the basis of what we know now, so somebody says, tell me what I need to know about this subject in one minute. Uh, let's start out with Jane. Okay, well, I'm a recovering politician, so I have no real credentials. Uh, but I noticed that Jill Doherty's in the audience, so we have another press oh, person. Fantastic. And we have Bob Belfer, whose name is on the door, and we have Pat Deutsch, who's fabulous. Um, much more interesting than John, I would acknowledge that. <laughs> so uh, the one-minute takeaway is uh, NSA has flunked crisis management. They do a horrible job of explaining their programs and, and always seem back-footed, and as a Recovering politician, I did learn that you get out ahead of bad news, which they should have done. That's number one. Number two, uh, it, we would have benefited from a debate on the front end of these policies. We didn't really have it. Uh, some of them were, were started by the Bush-Cheney White House under the President's Commander-in-Chief authorities uh, not going through Congress, and so that debate was missed. Uh, we're now playing catch-up. Uh, number three, uh, Law is analog, but technology is digital, and it's very difficult to imagine a set of laws that would really fit our capabilities. And number four to this cartoon, Graham, uh, security and liberty are not a zero-sum game. You either get more of both or less of both. Is that a minute? That's a minute. Thank you very much. John Deutsch. Thank you, Graham. Uh, you know, from time to time, there's a technology change that completely revolutionizes military affairs. Uh, an absolute, complete change. That's what's happened here. Ubiquitous digital communication everywhere means that the uh, NSA and the enterprise that was created to deal with the technology simply is unable to cope. The NSA was set up to believe that there was a distinction between foreign and domestic, between uh, security and law enforcement, between citizens and non-citizens. It was a distinction proper for the technology of the time, 1950s, done to really take care of the uh, great personal animosity between J. Edgar Hoover and uh, Alan Dulles, but it's completely unable to deal with the issues that technology presents today. So uh, what you have is we're tinkering. All the things you've heard now is we're tinkering with the NSA, with its principles, with the way it's organized, with its uh, responsibilities and authorities, when really, in fact, you have to go back and ask, as the French did and the Germans when they learned about telegraphy, lifting the data rates by a factor of 10,000. 
you have to change the way you think about this issue of national security and privacy. It's not just changing the NSA at the edges. You got to redo it using the new uh, realities of a digital communication. Dean. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit in a, in a way that might seem counter to the way you would expect a national public radio journalist to talk. And my uh, contribution to the elementary facts of this is to look at the metadata program and to say that so far, it doesn't mean that we'll maintain this way, but so far the evidence isn't that any laws have been broken. So I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a simple country journalist, but I thought I would give you a, a couple of elemental facts to think about when you think about this program. If you have some of the legal background, I think it will help you sort of look at the program in a different way. So the ACLU keeps saying that a federal judge has found the NSA's metadata program unconstitutional, and that's true. But what they don't say is that another federal judge, about a week after the first federal judge, Judge Pauley found it unconstitutional, this federal judge found it constitutional. And uh, just laying out the basic facts, there's a, there's a case that happened in 1979 that was called Smith versus Maryland. Are there lawyers in the audience? <laughs> Excellent, okay, stop me when I get it wrong. So, um, <laughs> so back in 1976, there was this woman whose name was Patricia McDonough, and she was robbed in Baltimore, Maryland, and she gave police a description of the robber and what she thought was his car, which um, for no particular reason I will tell you is a 1975 Monte Carlo. So she received some threatening phone calls from someone who said he was the robber. And in fact, at one point, he actually called her and said, go stand out on your front porch. And when she did, he drove by menacingly. Turns out the police saw the Monte Carlo in the, uh, in the neighborhood, took down the license plate, and were able to identify him as this man, Michael Lee Smith. This is where it gets interesting with metadata. They asked the phone company uh, to trace numbers that were called from Smith's home phone. And the company agreed. And that day, Smith happened to call Patricia McDonough. Police got a warrant. They searched his residence. They found a phone book that had a dog-eared page that was actually on the same page as McDonough's number was. And this is the case that established what you keep hearing over and over again about metadata, the third-party doctrine. Basically, what it means is that you have no reasonable expectation that numbers you dial remain private. The phone company, because it's a third party, has those numbers, and uh, you voluntarily turn them over to a third party when you dial that number. And I know you need me to uh, wrap up, and it's this, this third party doctrine, about which everybody is disagreeing. Does the new technology that Mr. Deutsch talked about, does that still fall under this idea of tapping a phone? And that's what is at issue now with the metadata program. Good, David. Um, great, well thanks for uh, letting me join all of you. I would say that um, the NSA has got uh, a few big lessons to learn beyond the ones that, uh, that John Deutsch uh, laid out, and I agree with all of those. One of them is life is not going to return to the way it was pre-Snowden for them. They would like to think that this is one leak and the leak goes away and they can recede back into the shadows again. That's not the case. The NSA previously never had to go put up with an examination of many of its practices because unlike the CIA, it wasn't the source of pretty regular leaks. The CIA is all about human beings interacting, human beings leak. Technology has not until now, but what we've learned from WikiLeaks to Snowden is that when there are technological leaks, they're huge, they come in digital size. And so we now know about many of the major programs. Second point, the biggest impact of these leaks, I suspect, will not be diplomatic because Germany's got to deal with the United States and Japan has to deal with the United States and so forth. It will be economic because we ha now have countries that are talking about subdividing the internet, the great unifying element of technology in the past 30 years. They want to cut up a German-only internet, a Brazilian-only internet. I think these efforts will fail, but it's an interesting effort because it's going to be used for a number of protectionist purposes. And secondly, 
the era of cooperation between American technology companies and the NSA is over. It's over because those companies believe the backlash at home and abroad from dealing with the NSA is far greater than they ever believed before. A third and a, a last point on uh, the future for the NSA. The NSA is entering a period where it is discovering that the metadata program uh, that you just heard about from Dina is the least important part of the Snowden revelations. Getting at phone numbers is not exactly the leading edge of NSA technology. Cyber is. And that's why you're beginning to see a shift in the coverage away from the issues that were raised in the metadata program and toward the decisions that the president isn't standing up and announcing, the ones that don't have the kind of political impact of whether or not they're watching your telephone numbers and who you're calling. The most interesting decisions the president hasn't announced yet, whether or not he will take up the recommendation of his advisory group to um, stop weakening encryption. Well, the NSA was invented to, to strengthen encryption. And lastly, whether or not he will take up their, agreement, their recommendation that they not uh, participate in finding flaws in software called zero-day flaws that are critical to doing cyber attacks. They were critical to the attacks on Iran. Those are the hard decisions, and when you call the White House and ask where the president is on these right now, they say, uh, let us get back to you some undetermined day in the future. Joe Knight. Well, <clears throat> I think first it's important to realize this is not a case of a rogue intelligence agency. Uh, Dina is exactly right. Unlike the things that were disclosed by the church hearings in the 1970s, where you had abuse of power by FBI and CIA, NSA was doing its job. It was doing the legal thing. What was really happening was that technology was made, <laughs> allowing to overachieve. And the political system for controlling it was on autopilot. And the problem was not that NSA did wrong, it's that it did very well. It did about as, it, it did as well as you could imagine. So the problem that we face domestically is how do you bring the principles of Madisonian government, checks and balances and controls, in which the FISA court for the judiciary and House and Senate oversight for the legislature are able to cope with this new extraordinary burgeoning of technology which we summarize as big data, which is brought about by the extraordinary growth of computing power. And the other thing is, what do you do about the intelligence capabilities overseas? On the first, uh, what do you do about the domestic controls? Obama has recommended a number of things, which are strengthening the FISA court, uh, having the companies hold the data rather than the government, hold the data and so forth, which probably can restore a good deal of what we think are Madisonian checks and balances. On the other hand, if you look overseas and you ask, uh, what are we going to do when the president says we will respect the privacy of Americans and then the Germans and others say, what about our privacy? And he says, we'll take that into account. We haven't figured that out at all. So basically, I'd say that uh, uh, we're getting a rethink <coughs> about uh, the way in which institutions haven't kept up with technology. I think we're on track to correct that at home, not abroad. Okay, let me drill down uh, briefly, with, first with Dina, because I think you introduced the metadata conversation. And in the material that was handed out that was prepared by an, a former Institute of Politics uh, intern who also now works for me, Alex Loomis, you'll see a little quick summary of what are these five buckets and the metadata issue. So, uh, Dina, you said, as far as you can see from the reporting so far and the evidence so far, no violations of the law. Interestingly, uh, if you uh, take the report of the president's panel, the commission that he created, that included three lawyers, one of whom, Cass Sunstein, is one of our colleagues here at Harvard, they report, quote, their, their conclusion, no evidence of illegality or other abuse for the purpose of targeting 
domestic political activity, close quote. David, I don't think I read this in the New York Times, a message like this. Do you disagree? No, I, I don't disagree, but I would have to say that um, Dean is absolutely right that the programs appear to have been legal. That'll get sorted out sooner or later. But I think that the, the critical question is the one that Joe asked, which is you could have a legal program that no one sort of fully thought through. And as a result, it's not at all clear that uh, there is the kind of political control on it that there needs to be. You know, CIA programs, Graham, every year they go back and they have a review that usually goes up to the White House level and ask the question, if this program shows up on the front page of the New York Times or the Washington Post or is broadcast by NPR, is the value that we're getting from the intelligence we're receiving greater than the damage that will be done by its revelation? And if the answer to that question is no, then they're stopping and asking the question, do we really want to go do this? So then we went back and we asked, so what kind of review do the NSA programs go through? Does somebody ask that same question? What's the value that you're getting from listening to Angela Merkel's cell phone calls or those of the dozens of others they were listening to, um, including the French president, it looks like, and that those might have been more amusing phone calls. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, so, but just so, so that we're clear, and then we go to, to Jane. Yeah. So there's one charge, which is activity was illegal or unconstitutional. Many people have made that charge. Charge, And I think if we were to take a vote about what people might have gathered from what they read in the paper, they might think that there was a transmission, sorry, violation of law or constitution. Again, we don't know everything I now. I think what they would know is that there, moment, there's division among the courts about that issue. That's right. And the Supreme Court happens to be on one side, and there's a couple of, court, a couple of judges at the... So that's number one. Number two, there's a second question which Joe raised and which I wanted to ask Jane about in any case, the oversight processes, both within the, within the executive branch and in Congress. So you went through this struggle for oversight in the whole intelligence community, including NSA. So what would, what okay. would you say either about the law or about the oversight? So I forgot to acknowledge, I didn't see them, Al and Robin Carnesall also in the front row. Al used to run this place, thought I'd point that out and was provost of Harvard and then was at UCLA in my state. Um, welcome. Uh, so back to this. We're conflating a lot of different programs. In the Reagan administration in the 80s, uh, he issued an executive order, which doesn't have the force of law, but it does have the force of executive uh, uh, policy. Uh, executive order 12333, which was the basis for the phone, uh, listening to the cell phones. Uh, that is not connected to the post 9-11 programs. Post 9-11, there were at least, I, I didn't see your materials, Graham, my, my fault, but the phone, there was the phone metadata program, which was developed by the Bush-Cheney White House outside of the law, outside of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which was passed in the 70s in response to the Church Committee uh, report on the Nixon abuses. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, we could go into that. But there was the phone metadata program, which the White House developed, and which, when Congress learned that it didn't comply with FISA, Congress insisted that it be changed and that FISA be changed so that the, fo the phone program was under FISA. And then there is the so-called PRISM program, which also has been di disclosed, which is the Internet program. And that's uh, Section 702. Both of them are, have been legislated, Section 702 and Section 215, which is the phone metadata, and both of them expire every three years. They sunset. That is what Congress did to make sure they were thoroughly uh, reassessed. And the phone metadata program expires next, next year. If Congress does not act, that program goes away. And as you heard from David and Joe, the president has suggested major changes to it. As for oversight, I, I first of all, there have been no abuses of the program. I'm one who voted for these Patriot Act sections. I did that because I felt we do need robust surveillance. And what I was concerned about was, number one, that there was a legal framework around the programs, and number two, there was, a, two, there was an oversight regime. And there is. 
the congressional uh, uh, intelligence committees in, in particular do oversee this program and the FISA court, which is a federal court with rotating judges on it, uh, is not a rubber stamp, not. There have been a number of, of FISA court opinions that have disallowed certain practices under the program. I support the notion of making all of this more transparent, releasing FISA court opinions that don't compromise soliciting methods, and moving the metadata out of government hands back into the phone companies. I think this is all good and will get more public buy-in, but bottom line, no abuses, and I believe that there have been significant successes viewed as a whole across the program. Okay, so let's see who disagrees, who disagrees with this conclusion. Rita? If I could just uh, look at one tiny part of what you said, Jane, and that has to do with moving this data to telephone companies or to third parties is what they're planning to do. There is a school of thought that doing that could invade privacy even more than having the NSA hang on to it. But there are, as you say, lots of regulations and lots of oversight on how the NSA can use this information. And uh, Google, let's just use as an example, uh, has quite a lot of information on me and on you, and they can use that information however they see fit, to sell us things or to help other people find us to sell us things. And privacy advocates, and this is something I've been doing as a Neiman Fellow this year, have great concerns about yeah. moving it to a third party. So that is not the panacea here. It's, it's one solution, I'm but it's not I'm not in favor panacea. of doing that. I think that's as, you know, as worrisome as the government holding the data. The reason for the moving it to the phone company uh, idea is that the phone companies already hold the data for an average of 18 months. They do this for law enforcement reasons and to make you pay your bill. Uh, <laughs> by the way, uh, I don't think it was in the New York Times. It was in the Washington Post. There was an article claiming that we have the ability worldwide to listen retroactively to phone calls for 30 days. That article is not accurate. We don't. Okay. John Deutsch, what do you say? Uh, I'm in a different uh, space space here. Okay. I, uh, uh, the first thing is, I, I guess I want to just make a remark to a few of you in the audience here. Uh, if done responsibly, uh, this technology really is very much to the security advantage of the United States, both in criminal activities such as drugs, but also in uh, counterterrorism and in, uh, in other uh, diplomatic issues that we face and foreign policy issues. So it's very much in favor of the United States. That's the first thing. Second thing, I would like to say two things about how it's overseen. Uh, the NSA is a huge agency and it is uh, reports nominally to the Secretary of Defense, who's executive agent for the NSA, and also to the, uh, you don't mind my using these old terms, the Director of Central Intelligence. Uh, the head person who's the head of the NSA is responsible for communication security of all the armed services, the uh, signals intelligence activities which support the armed services, uh, intelligence activities which report which support the president and his top foreign policy advisors, and all kinds of stuff which is done uh, for homeland protection and for uh, criminal investigations properly approved by the FISA court. Uh, the oversight that that poor man who, or poor woman who heads the NSA is one lonely, busy, overextended deputy secretary of defense. And there is a very little really practical, administrative, thoughtful oversight that occurs in the same way that uh, Al Carnesile gave oversight to the Kennedy School when yeah. he was provost. Uh, have we, have uh, we ever known a deputy secretary of defense? I don't know. I don't know. Now, that, the <laughs> second point I want to make is I have another big <laughs> oversight issue. I believe the Justice Department ought to have one and only one responsibility, and that is to make sure that the rights of U.S. citizens and U.S. entities are respected. But they don't. They have a huge conflict of interest. They're up to this stuff, up to their eyeballs. And uh, from time to time, they even get in trouble with it. So I have a, an issue about whether we have right the basic distinction of the Justice Department being in charge of oversight of U.S. rights and uh, uh, legal responsibilities, and the Justice Department actively, aggressively 
going and using these same techniques to help them go after law enforcement. I have a big problem. I think there's a fundamental uh, uh, a conflict there. So I think all of this has to be relooked. But I will tell you this. I firmly believe that when the uh, New York Times or uh, PBS, is that what it is? Close enough. Uh, NPR. When they explain how, in, now not in the detail of Mr. Snowden, but when they explain what is the capability of the United States and how they're using it, not always perfectly, to protect and defend U.S. interests and threats, I believe that the average American will be much more comfortable at the balance which is we're trying to reach here than they are today. So I'm for disclosure, much more disclosure about the qualitative things that are done without embarrassment. Joe, agree or disagree? Yeah. No, I, 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 I largely agree, but I think that uh, you have to go back to something Dina says, which is we have a technology which is allowing the accumulation and storage of vast amounts of data. And the question of whether it's held by a private company or by the government is an interesting point. One reason not to have the government hold it is the government can lock you up or kill you. A uh, private company can. And we have a long tradition in this country of wanting limits on government. That's basic principle of our founding. But on the other hand, when the government holds something, unless you have a disloyal insider like Snowden, government security is probably going to be a lot better. So if you have it held by the private companies, the question is, what about the criminal groups that are out there trying to get into it? They'll have it easier to get into Target, as we've now seen, through the air conditioners than they would through into NSA. So there's a real problem here, which is, what are we going to do now that we have the capacity, we as a society, to store and analyze vast amounts of information? We haven't thought that one through very well. I think having the private Having the telephone companies hold this phone data, metadata, is better than having government do it because you don't want some future J. Edgar Hoover or even some uh, clerk to check up on where his girlfriend spent the weekend last week. Uh, and that's you'd, a temptation. You'd rather have the clerk at Google yes. do it. Yes. <laughs> well, that's it. The clerk at, but the clerk at Google worries me a little less than the clerk okay, who worked good. for the government. David, agree or disagree? Very well, briefly. Yeah. Um, let me agree with one thing that Jane said and disagree with another. The agreement is the companies hold this anyway. And the debate that Google and Microsoft and others are worried about, about where this is headed, is what happens when the government begins to put restrictions on how they can use the data. Okay? And that's why they're so concerned about this group that John Podesta has begun to examine the broader issues yeah. of, of data collection. Um, but Joe's right. It's different when the government does it because we've got Fourth Amendment issues with the government that we do not have with the private companies, number one. And number two, the companies themselves, um, while they may misuse the data, you're going to at least have a way to go in and penalize them for doing that if, if it's discovered. Whereas in the, within the NSA, we would never know if the clerk was going in could go listen uh, to that. The one thing I'd like to disagree with, um, uh, both Jane and John have made the point that these programs have been very useful in counterterrorism issues. Except that when you go into the Presidential Advisory Committee report, they actually don't support that for the metadata program, at least. They say they couldn't find an example. Now, we know of some cases from outside reporting in which there's been a negative confirmation. In other words, they've gone off and looked at some phone numbers and said, no, we don't believe this group of terrorists operating in this country have connections back in the US. And that, too, is useful. But so far, we haven't found many successes coming out of the metadata program. Well, let me, one, let me, one, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> here, here, let me give you a quotation. <laughs> David, let me give you a quotation, David, and people then can agree or disagree. Sure. Our, our senior fellow non-resident, Michael Morell, who was deputy director of CIA, here's a quote. He says, quote, had the metadata program been in yeah, place more than a decade ago, it would have prevented 9-11. And it has the potential to prevent the next 9-11. So w this is true or false? It's true that it may have prevented 9-11 had it been in place, because you might have heard the plotters who were in San Diego. 
but he signed off on a report that said that once it was in place, they couldn't find examples in which it had tracked someone down and helped them with it. Now, maybe there was no such case. So both well, statements and, are true. And so both statements <laughs> can yeah. be true. And, you know, uh, it, Mr. Morrell has also made the point that, you know, your house may not have burned down in the past 10 years, but it doesn't mean that you cancel all your fire insurance. Mm -hmm. And this program is part of your fire insurance. May I make but a remark? Please. I'd like to make a remark, here, if I may. I, I think that uh, by focusing on the metadata program and focusing on did it do something about counterterrorism, you miss an entire universe of places where this had an absolutely for sure, for sure effect. But on, just not in metadata. I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm waiting to hear what Mike Morrell says next round, but my view is, and by the way, everything you read in government commission reports, even if they contain distinguished Harvard faculty, isn't necessarily <laughs> correct. No. But my point, my point I want to make is, my point I want, well, it's not true because an MIT person is different. But my point I want to make is, you've got to make sure every time you say those things that you say, but there's another vast amount of stuff. Absolutely. Like if you want to look and see what's done in the counter drug world, where this has been absolutely uh, very, very effective. Or organized crime. Or, right. well, Jane. But let me. Let me add that with respect to these programs, the post 9-11 programs, the predicate is a foreign bad guy, not a U.S. bad guy, not that there aren't U.S. bad Drugs. guys and girls. Well, the, okay, but, but they, the, the identification of the foreign bad guy comes with either a phone number or an email address or something like that in the pocket litter of people, the, the stuff that's attached to people that are picked up, and that start is then chained to other people through these programs, whether algorithms are used or just straight, he called him and he called him and so forth. And now we have this limit, which we could also debate about two hops. Right. Uh, you can only go through two rounds of this, which I think is arbitrary and which bad guys who are digitally very savvy, certainly more savvy than I am, can game around. I, I just wanted to say one other thing. Uh, Snowden's name was raised. I thought I'd put out there what I happen to think of Edward Snowden, uh, which is not good. He's been charged with crimes, so I'm not going to call him names. He should come back here and face trial. He would have a fair trial in this country. That's what we do, and there's enormous public sympathy for him, not for me. Uh, what he took uh, with thumb drives was not just uh, details about these post 9-11 programs that have application to US citizens, but was our whole defense technology playbook. And now bad guys have that too. All the ways in which we, are, we have capabilities that have to do uh, way beyond surveillance of any US citizen, which I would argue comply with law. And that stuff is, has been hugely dangerous to us. And if he, last point, if he had wanted, if he said he couldn't blow the whistle in this country. He didn't try too hard. He could have come to Congress, which would have listened to him. He could have gone to a country other than China. How about Norway? <laughs> okay, so let me, let me just, we're, we're, we're gonna let all the pa panelists agree or disagree, but on Snowden, on the basis of what we know now, obviously we don't know a lot, uh, net impact on Americans will be up or down. Jane says down. What does the panel say? Up. You could go up or down. Thumbs up or thumbs down. It's too simple. I okay, wait, wait, I Joe. Had a wait, wait, let the other ones, David. No, you right. got to go. Right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with Joe. You can say that he violated of course all of his commitments. Of course, there's on the one hand and the other right. hand. No, no, yeah. no. I'm yeah. going to vote up and down at the same okay. time. <laughs> the sense that I think he had a net beneficial effect domestically and a terrible effect internationally. And therefore, for Americans. If I, had to, if I had to summarize it, net negative, but I think to ignore the fact that he launched the debate which we needed to have, which is how do you bring our checks and balances, our Madisonian institutions, up to date for the technology, thumbs up. Okay. Let's, let's put it this way. The president would not have come out a week and a half ago and radically changed a program that he had approved for five years running had it not been for Snowden. Okay. And, and I guess I would say one other thing, too. I think what the Snowden uh, revelations have done is given adversaries a lot of ideas, not just foreign, uh, foreign countries or, or what we consider our enemies, but also 
organized crime now s can say to their hackers, you know what, never occurred to us to do this. Can you give that a try? And I think that is one thing, um, I mean, I haven't been reading the newspapers as religiously as I used to while I've been in school, but I think that's something that has been missed in this debate, is that there's a whole other wrinkle here that uh, hasn't been discussed that goes beyond privacy concerns, but goes, how much did Snowden give any kind of adversary a leg up on what the U.S. is doing? Well, President Obama offered his two cents on this. In January, he said, quote, the sensational way in which these disclosures have come out has often shed more heat than light while revealing methods to our adversaries that could impact our operations in ways that we may not fully understand for years to come. So again, it's uncertain, and we, we don't know everything now. But John, do you have a agree? You were kind of, I think, thumbs down, but I'm not sure if you were trying to do both ways at the same time. Goofy question. <laughs> oh, okay. Because it's happened. And the issue is, once it's happened, how does the United States deal with that, both domestically, and as Joe, I think, quite rightly said, the effect on the foreign uh, observers, as he and I have heard on different occasions, is extremely, they, they really feel, uh, so I, I really think the issue is more how do you deal with Snowden if you're the President of the United States or the country, rather than, gee, is this up or down? I mean, he, it happened, you know, and you've got to deal with the can consequences. I, can I follow what you said? Because I think the, if we're really serious about where do you go from here, I think on the domestic side, what Snow's launch has been healthy and we're on our track. In other words, the so-called 215 issues, I think we're gonna solve that. This is the domestic oversight, how do you restore Madisonian principles at home? On the international side, we don't have a clue. And David raised this. Should, I spent the day at MIT at a cyber conference full of foreigners. Good for and let me tell you, the lack of trust in the United States and in our procedures that the Snowden revelations have created is really costly to us. Well, and at rate, no, just to finish, but uh, David pointed out, NSA was once in the business of both encrypting and, in other words, protecting our communications and decrypting others' communications. More recently, we've done much of the latter. Should we get back into a situation where we want to encourage encryption. Should we, for example, have a bank where we say when we discover zero day exploits, we're going to actually give them back to Microsoft or iOS? Should we be thinking of ways to try to restore confidence in the way our companies use the internet? These are big, difficult questions which we're not yet beginning to come to. I, I actually think we're, we're far ahead here. First of all, the, the domestic debate had started. Congress did yeah. act, maybe nobody noticed, but I noticed, I was there and a number of other people were debating these programs and to remind, 215 expires next year right. if, if it is not renewed. So, I mean, there is a mechanism in place. Before Snowden, he had nothing whatsoever to do with that. Second, internationally, I was just in London the last three days, they get it over there. Um, there's been a very close intelligence cooperation. There are three different levels of this. On the intelligence level, uh, nobody's upset because they all understood what these programs were anywhere, including in Germany. Uh, on the elected official level, they're upset because their public is upset, but they understood the intelligence. They were all briefed too. So on, on the one hand, privately they're not upset, but publicly they are. On the public level, in Germany in particular, they're furious. Uh, because of the Stasi history. But that is not true in Italy, in, in England, and in a number of other countries. So it is complicated, um, but I, I, it wasn't a zero star here. And I still would say about Snowden, we would have had this debate slower than we're having it, mm -hmm. but we would have had this debate. Uh, as, as we're wrapping up, the, I'm gonna let you, David and, and Dina, uh, let me remind the audience that uh, there's also opportunities for you to ask a question. There are two microphones here on the ground floor and two microphones in the loges. If you'll stand up at the microphones, we'll call on you, but David was gonna say something and yeah. Dina. This builds on what uh, Joe was saying before. One of the most interesting things about the revelations as we've gotten a chance to dig further in them and then ask yes. questions that go beyond what's in the documents is that there are, is a growing debate about whether or not the United States 
has engaged in some hypocrisy here in what kind of activities we're outraged when they're, when they're done to us, and we're not quite as outraged when we do them abroad. So, David, the U.S. would never engage in hypocrisy. I realize it's shocking, uh, Graham, but, but sooner or later in your life you were going to have to face these issues. No, you know? no. <laughs> so, exactly. Go ahead. Um, so, for example, um, we, the United States has been extraordinarily concerned with very good reason about the daily Chinese attacks on American corporations uh, and on the American government and an effort to steal intellectual property. When newspapers, including the Times, were writing about this last year and detailing the degree to which these attacks were run by the People's Liberation Army, or at least linked to them, government officials were applauding this kind of coverage. This year, as we have had an opportunity to discuss how the NSA has gotten into Chinese companies like Huawei, which has been banned from the U.S. for its suspected links to the PLA, and how the U.S. has gone in to build into Huawei a big networking and telecommunications company, build in the kind of back doors that we fear they would use here, there's been a very different reaction in the U.S. government. At, this became a subject of conversation between President Obama and President Xi just two weeks ago, right after some of the, the big coverage on this issue. And so I think that's a healthy debate to have. Because as Joe was saying before, we need some norms about how we're all going to operate in this space. We're not going to have an honest discussion on that until the activities of both the U.S. and the Chinese and others are revealed. Okay, Dina and then John. Yeah. Go ahead with that question. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I, go John, ahead. I have one, a one-point remark. I think that at a certain stage of the game, the question has to be raised, do you want to think of a new design for the NSA? not just tinkering around the edges. There are really some issues there. I don't even get into tonight, but I do think that it's got an awfully broad span of responsibility, and uh, it would, I think, it deserves some scrutiny and discussion. Well, there was a suggestion made in the report of this uh, President's Commission, and that was to make the NSA a confirmable position and to split it with Cyber Command at the Defense Department. Ah instead of having the NSA director be a three-star who held both jobs. The president rejected that right. before the commission but report. Well, it was going to be a civilian, too, which I thought was a little goofy, too. Right? And John, do you have a, a short uh, thought about what that redesign would look like? No, I only have a long thought, which you don't no, want. Oh, so let's go on. So we will listen to the long thought after. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Let me go to this gentleman. The rules are here, short. Uh, please introduce yourself initially, and questions in with a question mark. Uh, uh, Jed Schwartz, a uh, writer. Uh, uh, is the FISA court uh, subject to any appeal? I mean, is, is it possible to appeal FISA court decisions to a higher court like the Supreme Court? A. B. We have overlooked, all of you and, and I until now, have overlooked the possibility of uh, using these technologies to uh, 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 survey the conversations of, for example, uh, corporation, corporate managerial people, which it seems to me could be extremely useful uh, in the event of, uh, for example, patent abuse suits. Or, uh, I mean, I mean, think if think if the people at Enron had been able to be uh, tapped. You know, I mean, just uh, think about that. And also the question of uh, surveilling phone conversations in and around tax havens f in order to uh, uh, achieve tax compliance. Okay. I mean, all that has been overlooked in, 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 in I think, the entire uh, national discussion of, the, of these topics. And, and uh, I, you know, I, I think that's a good question. But, yeah. Thank you. I, I should have said one question per customer, but there were such good <laughs> questions, Thanks. we're going to take all three. Yeah. <coughs> On the first one, maybe, Jane, you would say? The FISA court opinions are not appealable as such, but the, there always is the opportunity to bring a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the program, and several have been brought. Today, the Supreme Court denied expedited certiorari <coughs> of, a, of a D.C. decision that said the program's unconstitutional. One, t and to your second question, we do not do economic espionage through these programs. Remember, there's a foreign terrorist predicate. <coughs> so on the other two questions, 
on the why this would be useful well, for listening to the I thought that's what I corporate answered. or you can, corporate. You can do it, it now. You get a warrant. Do what you yeah. do, you we don't, don't want to do it through surveillance. You want to get a warrant from a judge to yeah. say, go listen to this guy from Enron who's a crook. Right. That's what our Constitution is about. Right. Anybody else agree or disagree? No. This gentleman, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is uh, Ben Bolger, and I'm a Harvard alum. Um, I have a question for um, John Deutsch. Um, Jeremy Bentham uh, wrote about the idea of a panopticon, mm -hmm. where people, if they were observed, would over time uh, correct their behavior or perhaps engage in less criminal behavior. If we talk about big data, and if people know that they are ubiquitous, ubiquitously being watched, in general, won't we uh, reduce crime and criminal behavior? Is the fact that we are observing people, even though it's a loss of privacy, going to lead uh, to better overall society behavior? I don't know, but I would doubt it. I don't know. Okay. I think it's an extremely interesting question, though, but the invoking of Bentham ought to give Joe a, yeah, <laughs> a long answer. Okay. To Joe. Joe, is this uh, deontology or consequentialism? I'll, I'll okay. defer to Dina. Okay, Dina. Uh, I was just going to say that, that we, without having the big data component, we do know that crime goes down if you have the appearance of cameras or cameras actually running. They don't even have actually have to be going on. Uh, and that answers your question in that respect. Whether having this vague sense that big data or big brother might be looking at you, I'm, I think that's a little um, far-fetched, but we do know that surveillance cameras do change behavior. Shift the place the crime's going on. It could, but if you see a camera, it makes you think twice before you jack and the if, car. And if, if he's got the big data working everywhere, you may not be able to shift. <laughs> if I can't help recalling Ken, our former uh, colleague, Ken Galbraith, who once here in the discussion said, remember, conscience is that small wee voice in the back of your mind that says somebody may be watching. So, <laughs> so please. Hi, my name's Will. Um, I'm an undergraduate, and I appreciate you coming to speak with us today. Um, I'm curious, Mr. Deutsch's long answer uh, on his thoughts of Edward Snowden's actions. The ethics, specifically, and his choice to flee to China and then seek asylum elsewhere. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm curious, your, your thoughts you about Snowden. Edward Snowden's actions. Snowden's actions. Do you believe they were ethical in his choice to flee to China? No, I didn't, I didn't say they were ethical. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm asking. You, he's what, asking what, what a question. You your assessment of Snowden and his uh, going to China and then to Russia. I mean, I, I mean, he's a criminal. He has to go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you might prefer for him to go a place where it would be oh, less you mean, damaging. You, you mean that, he, that, that uh, maybe Norway, as Jane said. It's done. Whatever it is, it's done. Okay. This lady in the, in the loge, please. Hi. Um, I'm Jenny. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about trust and um, how corporations and the government can kind of manage their relationship going forward. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg um, publicly sort of called Obama to complain about the NSA. In a kind of similar way, um, Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen wrote an article in the New York Times um, saying that um, corporations should join the open source community, for instance. And um, I, I was just wondering sort of how corporations and the government can kind of manage a partnership given the decreasing trust um, of the public in the future. If I could say something, um, I think that uh, what they're saying is not really what they mean. What they're saying is they're upset about the fact that this has given an opening to foreign yeah. uh, companies to move in yeah. on their turf, which is happening. Uh, one of us said that, I, not I. Uh, but not only are we balkanizing the internet, but these foreign companies are claiming sign up with us, even Americans, sign up with us and we'll protect your data better than these American companies can do it. And that's upset our companies that their market share is being threatened. There has long been cooperation between U.S. companies and our government. Under these sections, there has to be a, a court order to compel them to turn over data. Uh, under Section 215, when it was uh, formalized as part of FISA, uh, they were given immunity from past actions because they believed in good faith that they were complying with court orders, and then they discovered it wasn't a valid court order because the program wasn't valid. Oops. But at any rate, 
There has been a long history of cooperation. And finally, on cyber, which we really haven't discussed, which is a huge issue, uh, and a lot of people here know a lot about it, far more than I do, there are ongoing efforts now uh, between the private sector and the Homeland Security Department to work out protocols where data is shared. Because if one of them is penetrated, uh, that is something that should be known by others and by our government so we can block that uh, against a, a, a broader universe. And if they don't share data, that won't happen. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I Mark Zuckerberg is shocked. I get it, he's shocked. Um, <laughs> but he's really not shocked. David. Yeah, just a, a quick point. This is an excellent question on, on the trust issue. The companies have cooperated when given a court order. And in the past, they cooperated sometimes even when they weren't given a court order. Yeah. The, the days of the second happening are over. And I actually don't see them coming back. Moreover, what you're now seeing from Microsoft, from Google, from Yahoo and others, is having discovered that their networks were pierced outside of their knowledge. For example, between the different Google servers. They are now working on technologies that they believe will make it almost impossible for the NSA to get get into their data without their knowledge. Now, whether that will be successful, I don't know. But what you have now seen is a private sector that is working on new encryption technologies to defeat the US government, and the US government debating among themselves, among itself, whether or not the NSA should be in the business of weakening or strengthening encryption. And this has started a huge fight within the intelligence community because many in the intelligence community believe that they are being asked to unilaterally disarm. So, and but I David, let me, let me stay, because I think it's, it's not, uh, either it's not clear or I disagree. So first, you, you it could be not clear and you could no, disagree. No. <laughs> you, you will be shocked to, to learn that companies engage in hypocrisy sometimes as well, especially when talking to the newspaper. And therefore, as Jane said, they are shocked, shocked. So there's nothing, I didn't hear any, any news from Eric Schmidt, I didn't hear any news from Zuckerberg, excuse me. Yeah. Oh my God, you did this, I couldn't believe this. Okay. So that's, I don't, there's no news there. Secondly, if you ask, so you, you're now, the, we go a, cir a circle, uh, we go a, another uh, chapter in this book. And NSA says, we're giving up uh, breaking encryptions of, uh, iPhones or smartphones. And now a terrorist uses a smartphone and they blow up another building. And you say, well, thank goodness you didn't uh, uh, decrypt their encryption because that would have let you listen to many people's phone calls. And we prefer you not to be able to break encryptions. Would you think that anybody would agree with that? I don't think so. Yeah. No, and that's what's happened in the pendulum swing here. Right. In the first few years after 9-11, my guess is that had the NSA come out and said, there's a certain group of things we need to go do, including collecting all the both telephone numbers, looking at the metadata, being able to crack the iPhone, had the iPhone been uh, around at that time, they probably would have gotten some, a lot of buy-in to doing That's that. Right. It's the fact that they didn't in go about not only talking about this with the public, but also talking about it sometimes, honestly, with the companies that has created the reaction that they've got today. And so my, my working supposition here, and I could be completely wrong on this, is that had they been more open about it early on, they probably would have a much more robust program today. And instead, their natural instinct for secrecy took over, and it's hurting them. And let's remember that the first part of the metadata program didn't go through Congress either. It didn't comply with FISA. Right. It was developed under the president's emergency authorities, and John Yoo was sitting in the, in the Justice Department writing legal opinions to justify it. And we learned after the fact, too, that there was a, a, a rebellion in the Justice Department. Remember John yeah. Ashcroft sick in the hospital and um, um, Comey and others coming to him and trying to get permission right. to, to extend the program. Journalism that happened, not from yeah. the oversight of the well, we did, but we did, including including a not bad book by one of the panelists. Uh, this gentleman. Uh, my name is Harvey Rishikoff. I'm the co-chair of the American Bar Association. Uh, 
uh, Great. national Hi. task force on uh, cyber and the law with Judy Miller. And I spent the day with uh, Joe and I at the Cyber Norms. Uh, my, my question is sort of tailing on what's the, uh, one of our core issues. Because the cyber norms, if you take the private corporations, they're worried about their reputational products. Their product is sovereign because they want to go on the international marketplace. So Joe mentioned the idea, well, if the intelligence community finds a zero-day def defect in one of these products, should there be a bank? And if you would have seen John Deutsch's face, <laughs> he clearly registered as former DCI. That would be an – I don't know what you're, if you think that would be an odd thing to do. So there's this real incredible tension that exists, which is America's capacity for innovation in the cyber world and all of our software products, and at the same time our need for security in the intelligence community to exploit weaknesses that when we find them and what we do with them. That is a real extraordinary dilemma. And I'd be curious to see what the panel's sense is. And David mentioned the okay. fact, well, they would allegedly NSA attacked it without their knowledge, which would be a way of then deniability by the, by the actual corporation, versus now people realizing that corporation has a product that's vulnerable, and it makes it hard for people to use the product. That is an incredibly hard not, and I'd like Good, to hear the great, panel's Great, great, great question, and I think you read John Deutsch's face uh, correctly. John. Well, I, I think that it's uh, uh, very hard to be specific, although I can guarantee I could be, that the potential of protecting Americans by pre-planning or pre-stockpiling, if you like, a knowledge about how command and control goes on is uh, so vast that to say, We'll put it in a bank, uh, or put it to some kind of a, you know, kumbaya guy, you know, Harvard Law professor taking care of it is crazy. I mean, the potential here is tremendous to stop bad things from happening. You don't have to turn them on until you know some bad things are happening. So I, I just say to you that there's another very strong side of this, which. Uh, 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 you know, it's hard to get into its specifics, but I don't understand this idea. If you find out that somebody else's software is bad and you're a security person, you always have this issue of listen or jam. Do you make use of it or not? I mean, the answer is you put it away and you hope you never need to use it. So, I mean, I'm very much on the side of so, so, Joe, you lived through that too. Yeah. Well, well I, I didn't live through that. I uh, think the idea of, of taking zero days and having a back, I've heard a a very important person in this field last night say, if the government would make a market for zero days and purchase them all and thereby be a monopolist and get rid of them, we quickly dry up the potential. I'm not willing to go that far. I think that's too much. On the other hand, I think what the government can do is start redrawing that balance of where it was on encryption and decryption and realize that the internet in the future is going to have to have a lot more encryption in it than it has now, and place less emphasis on the on the decryption side. So you might uh, you can take different views on different parts of this, but I think there is going to be some need to do something uh, to restore a degree of trust. With all that said, I, uh, you got to remember we're not the only player in this game, and the fact that the Chinese uh, that we might have a self-denying ordinance and the Chinese don't, is, uh, you, you know, some Silly. people are going to still want American companies' products rather than Huawei, because if somebody's surveilling or doing things better the Americans than the way the I Chinese do. Jane, Jane. Well, first of all, on these exploits, this is a, a really serious problem. There is a, an eBay for exploits, or so it's been explained to me. and. Uh, Buying one of these things, which is an open back door into the underpinnings of somebody's technology, uh, can cost uh, as little as $25,000. So you're a bad guy and you want to take down some piece of the electric grid or pick anything. Uh, it's not that hard. And we have to, it seems to me, we, the government, I don't, well, I don't work in the government, but our government has to protect us against this, at least as it affects infrastructure or uh, major aspects of our privacy. So I, I don't want to make that harder. I want to make that easier, wh whatever we do about it. Okay, I Dina and then John. <laughs> okay. um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this trust issue in a different way that, that, that this um, young lady talked about. And 
One of the things that, I, I was at a cyber dialogue in Toronto last weekend, and one of the things that came up is that, in fact, there was a program in which they would pretend to be Microsoft and an update, and this would hit your computer, not yours, but the computer they were targeting. They, of course, want the Microsoft update to fix the bug, and then they would actually have access to that computer. Now, this isn't an unheard of thing. In the old days, you used to have GE and these major corporations who would say, no problem, it, you know, if your guy's a CIA guy, you're working for us, but now that we know, that's great. Here's what the really big difference is. Microsoft, whether true or not, and if you would read David's uh, coverage, you'd say they didn't know about it. So the problem here, the trust gap, is the idea of consent. And that's what I think that we need to sort of try and figure out as we, we try and, and navigate all of this. Well, John, I, then I, I, one point I want to make is uh, when I went into government the last time in 93, we arrived with an enormous initiative of NSA for the clipper chip. Nobody here is old enough to remember the clipper chip. <laughs> but the idea the NSA said is commercial uh, encryption is going to be progressively more important and we're going to give you a government patented, government assured device that is going to do all your encryption for you. Well, it was, uh, you know, not a long time till that collapsed under the, so I, I'm saying the it's idea that- our exports. <laughs> there, are a lot, I mean, there are a lot of things that matter with it, but I, I want to tell you, I can remember clearly, we'll talk about Podesta, he, he worked on his problem. And my point I want to make, Joe, is to say they're going to work more on, on encryption rather than, you know, cracking code. I'm all for it, but I don't think that's going to get you a lot of relief from these problems. Okay. David, that's the what I'm making. David, a short comment, and we have two more questions. Quick, Jeff, quick point on these awfully named zero days. And they are named that because there are, when you use a zero day flaw, it means that no one has ever seen it before. It's existed for zero days, and therefore it enables you to get into a computer system. It's the reason that in Olympic Games, which was the US program against Iran, I think they used four zero day flaws in order to get into the Iranian control system. So if you're at the NSA and Cyber Command, you say, make me give these up, it's like, going to the nuclear forces and saying, you know, you really shouldn't be using missiles anymore, okay? So their view is this would be disarmament, as, as Joe points out, we're not the only ones in this market. And that's what makes it such a hard discussion. The difficulty is we have a U.S. government that right now has never acknowledged building cyber weapons, much less using these zero days. And until they get out and try to discuss this, the way we discussed nuclear deterrence in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we're not going to actually have the debate that Joe just described. Okay, this gentleman, and then the, in the loge, and then we're over, please. Hi, my name is Josh Stiefel. I'm a first year Kennedy student. In everything that's happened since uh, Snowden's release, does anything point to a structural or inherent weakness in the intelligence community structure, particularly as it currently exists under the Office of Director of National Intelligence? And if so, how do you go about fixing the DNI structure? I was the author of the law. I think you already answered this yes. <laughs> that created, uh, with the, the principal author of the law that created the Director of National Intelligence. It was not a perfect law. I know you're shocked. Um, but there was implacable resistance to it by the Vice President Dick Cheney, the Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld, and the Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Duncan Hunter. That was kind of a lot of obstacles. But George Bush was for it, and we managed to craft something, which is a joint command structure across 16 intelligence agencies, modeled uh, more or less after the structure we have for the military. Um, there are flaws in the law. I think the big flaw in the Snowden case was the way he was cleared and the way he was allowed to operate. That's not in the law. And we have now taken major steps, maybe not enough. We've done the same thing in the, with respect to State Department cables after the WikiLeaks thing to fix that. And there is no, no longer can a uh, systems analyst, there are only a thousand across our government, operate without a second person being involved. And in Snowden's case, he was one step ahead of the sheriff in about five jobs. And the way he was evaluated uh, is, is in the future going to be shared on a, on a better basis. But I just say one last thing. Uh, 
in 9-11, most people think the big failure was we operated in a need-to-know culture where things were not shared. And the FBI didn't talk to itself, didn't talk to the CIA. Had those things happened, we might have found the plot, unraveled the plot before it happened. We then, the pendulum swung to need to share culture. Um, maybe it swung too much, and that's what enabled Snowden with his thumb drive, which was illegal, to suck out so much information. Uh, somebody pointed out to me the other day that now we're in a need to blame culture, <laughs> uh, which I don't think is healthy. I think our government's functioning pretty well, and we have not had another catastrophic attack since 9-11. Thank God. This gentleman, the last question. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Max. I'm a freshman at the college. And I want to ask you a question about the bulk data programs, uh, or bulk data collection programs, maybe from a broader perspective. So I, I guess a lot of what you've said has sort of assumed through these hypothetical situations that they could potentially be effective. And it, that's essentially a case that's impossible to prove. But there is some argument, and this isn't something you've addressed, that actually all of these bulk data collection programs and other major you know, widespread intelligence collecting programs are actually ineffective. And the argument that some make is that they collect so much data that they basically hamper our intelligence community <laughs> from effectively analyzing it. And so the data that matters, they end up you know, not really using effectively. And I guess the prime example of this was the Christmas Day bombing a few years ago, where I think the US government or some part of our intelligence community did in fact have that data, but it never got passed up on the chain. Sure. And one argument for why that didn't happen is that there's so much data being collected. So my question to all of you is, what reasoning do you use? How do you prove that these very wide, you know, these bulk data collection programs have a significant value added to our intelligence that we otherwise wouldn't have? I think it's going to be hard to uh, make the argument stick that more data is on balance harmful. I mean, obviously, it it takes your time, but more data means that if you approach it well, you're going to get smarter quicker. Not true always, but saying that less data is better is a very hard position to defend. Any other? Uh, it tells you about why there are so many people on this campus and the MIT campus working on building better algorithms. Because if you've got all this data, it's only as good as your ability to sift through it quickly and accurately. And why didn't we collect all this data 20 years ago? Because there was no way to go through it. So we're only collecting it now because the NSA came to the conclusion that it had the algorithms to begin to actually make use of it, to find the needle in the haystack. And that gets to the point that we all began with, which is the technology here outpaced the political decision making about the issues that it raised. And, and that's what the Snowden affair has forced the United States to begin to confront. So let me try to uh, uh, bring us to a conclusion here. I think uh, David's comment actually picks up from John's first comment about what's the big event that's occurred here, that a technological revolution is increasingly making ubiquitous and cheap the collection, storage, and searching of all digital information. So that's just, and that's for a company called Google, and that's uh, for a country like the US, and a country like China, and a criminal like whoever, okay? So that's just happening, independent of whether we have an NSA or don't have an NSA, or whether we change this uh, position or that position. So this issue, I think, uh, is an early stage of a revolution that is just continuing to shock us every, every few years and will continue for some time. So it's actually a terrific topic for students in the school to pursue. So tomorrow night here in the forum at 6 p.m., you'll have another very special opportunity. Uh, Mir Degan, who's the former legendary uh, head of Mossad, and David Petraeus, uh, former uh, director of CIA, among other things, We'll be here at 6 o'clock. Tonight, we want to say thank you very much to a star panel. You guys are great. <laughs>